Here's a quick disclaimer. The views, statements, and opinions expressed in this program are those of the speakers. The statements are not intended to be product claims or medical advice. Hi, Diana Freik here. I'm the host of the Gooder Podcast, where I get to talk with the powerhouse women in the food, beverage, and wellness categories about their journeys to success and their insights on the industry. This episode is brought to you by Retail Voodoo. Retail Voodoo is a brand development firm providing strategic brand, marketing, and design services for businesses in the food, wellness, and beverage industries. Our clients include Starbucks, Kind, REI, PepsiCo, and Essential Water. If your goal is to crush your competition by driving growth and disrupting the marketplace with new and innovative ideas, give us a call and let's talk. You can find out more at retail-voodoo.com. Okay, now today I get to introduce to you all Betsy Frost, CEO of Hoplark Tea. Betsy is the CEO of Hoplark Tea. Tea, a non-alcoholic brewery in Boulder, Colorado. She is a marketing and PL leader who combines CPG experience with entrepreneurial mindset to build businesses, brands, and big ideas. Betsy brings a unique combination of running business at General Mills for 15 years with experience advising and running startups, including a role as president of Dry Soda with her friend and mentor, Sherelle Klaus. Hello, Sherelle, (laughs) who has also been on the show. She is an advisor to a number of women-owned startups, currently leads a women's mentor circle through the JEDI and OSC network used to run the Women in Leadership organization at General Mills and believes in the power of tapping into how we can uplift each other for the benefit of all. And before we officially welcome Betsy, uh, just a quick shout out to Rachel Haynes, one of the Retail Voodoo account managers who recommended that we connect. Rachel, it's been very cool to connect with Betsy. So thank you so much for that. And Betsy, welcome to the podcast. Hi, happy to be here. Yay. Are you in back in Minneapolis today? No, I'm actually in Boulder at the brewery. Oh, yeah. okay. What's the weather? <laughs> like I swear in the last couple of weeks, it's either 1400 feet of snow or sunny. I'm not sure. What's going on in, in Boulder today? Um, it is snowing today. So very fun. I get to come from snow and go back to snow in <laughs> Minneapolis tonight. So thank you for that. <laughs> Well, we have an employee in Minneapolis and she said that the, uh, she said that it's been snowing for a considerable amount of time and it just stopped a few days ago. So hopefully, hopefully you'll come back and it at least will be disappearing at some level. I don't know. I'm ready for it to be over. I'm ready for it to be over. (laughs) Well, you know, you and I saw each other for a brief minute at Expo West last week, and that was certainly fun. For those of you that don't know what Expo West is, it really is one of the largest food, beverage, and better for you brand, consumer packaged goods show in North America, focused really mostly on that better for you uh, type of products. It had, I don't did you hear it was over 80,000 attendees this year? I heard that. Um, yeah. We were debating. Uh, were- I heard I heard from New Hope it was 70. I heard from oh. a friend it was 90. So let's oh. just call it somewhere in there. You know? We'll call it 80. <laughs> That's a good yeah. middle of the road line. Yeah. Exactly. And how was the show for you? It was a great show. Uh, um, people were out in force. We saw a number of retailers that we haven't been able to talk to, a number of investors, and some super fans, which was amazing. Oh, super fans are the best. Love super fans. <laughs> well, before we get too much into it, let's start with Hoplark. Now, I am referring it to it as Hoplark Tea, but I think it's no longer Hoplark Tea. Is it just Hoplark now? It is just Hoplark. Um, okay. And that's because we are a non-alcoholic brewery uh, mm-hmm. based out of Boulder. Um, mm-hmm. If we were considered a brewery, uh, mm-hmm. we'd be the fifth largest independent brewery in the state. Oh my we goodness! Brew no alcohol, so yeah. we um, we steep or basically brew hops uh, mm-hmm. and combine it with teas for mm. our hop tea line. 
Mm -hmm. We also have a sparkling water line that has single varietal of hops. So you can actually taste the difference in Mm. each individual strain of the plant. Mm -hmm. And then we just launched uh, what we call our zero zero line, uh, which you can find in the NA beer set, which is our homage to beer. Um, So they're all zero calorie, zero sugar, Mm -hmm. zero alcohol, full Mm -hmm. flavored um, uh, flavor bombs, like Mm -hmm. calm. (laughs) Flavor bombs. Now, then there was a new product that your team shared with me when we were chatting that was quite tasty. Remind me what that was. I, yeah. I can think it was a new in it, it wasn't a line extension in but from a flavor standpoint, but it was a net new product. Is that right? Well, it's a, it's gonna come out under our zero zero line. Okay. But it's a hop sour. So oh. it is our take on a sour beer um, that mm. punches you up front and then uh, it's actually quite crushable in the end. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness. Okay. So let's, let's talk about Hoplark is uh, yeah. what is, who is Hoplark? What do you stand for? Yeah, we were started in uh, 2019 by Dean Eberhardt as uh, mm-hmm. our founder and he is a tinkerer and craft beer lover and was mm-hmm. taking a month off of drinking while he was doing whole 30 and was out at a brewery with his buddy and was mm-hmm. like just smelling the beers, very, mm-hmm. very hot nerdery and was like, why is this flavor profile locked in beer. Um, For tens of thousands of years, uh, really the only place that you can explore hops is within beer. And so he, uh, you know, moved around and tinkered with his, his distilling or, you know, his brewery equipment in his garage for about 18 months and reinvented kind of a way to brew just the hops without Mm -hmm. having any of the malt or sugars Mm -hmm. or fillers in the middle. Um, and hops on its own has kind of a bitter profile, um, which is a very interesting profile if you like beer, but it, it's also um, a plant and a flavor that uh, uh, brings out flavor in other ingredients. Mm-hmm. And so you end up with this range of hopped products from an IPA type flavor all the way to these new unique flavors like we mm. have in hibiscus or mm. we just did a limited release with lavender um, where the hops just bring a fuller flavor to the experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and all of it is just done by brewing the actual plants. Uh, so there's no flavors or extracts. It's just truly flavor from the plants. Interesting. Can I, I'd be curious. I'm wondering, we worked on a, a hops brand called Yakima Chief Hops uh, a few years ago. And I'm wondering if you guys might be using some of their lovely hops or if you we use another do. supplier. We <gasps> do you use some do. of their hops. Yes, we do we also use hops from Haas and some other folks, but we do use Yakima Chief Hops as well. Ooh, how exciting. I love it. Okay. So now you are in this kind of sober, curious space. What can you tell us about how th- this space is evolving right now and the consumer is evolving? Because my understanding is, is there's been some shifting in the last couple of years. Yeah, well, I, it's interesting because, you know, at Dry, we catered to Sober Curious as well. You know, Sherelle mm-hmm. created that project or that product back in 2005 right. when mm-hmm. the space was really about recovery and pregnancy, if you think mm-hmm. about it that way. Mm-hmm. And what started to pop in 2018 was kind of the rise of Sober Curiosity in the U.S., We saw it kind of coming up through the UK and in Europe first, but it is uh, the trying on of a sober lifestyle um, by people who may not have an addiction, but want to think of sobriety as part of their health and wellness kind of Mm -hmm. lifestyle. Um, Mm -hmm. And what we see is people, you know, the conversation back in 2018 was people like stopping drinking just like mm-hmm. taking it completely out of their lifestyle or mm-hmm. doing um, spurts like dry January or sober October or dry July of just like stepping out of it for a while, resetting yeah. and then coming back. Yeah. Um, and we're definitely seeing um, the rise of that across the board. In fact, what's interesting is this last dry January, um, I was reading an article had less participation overall than the year before as really? people were like coming out of COVID. Yeah. But one of the reasons was because people are drinking less overall. So they don't yeah. need to take an entire month off. Um, Interesting. But, but it, it really is part of how people are looking at, at health and wellness. Um, part of it is physical wellness. Part yeah. of it is mental wellness yeah. and not wanting to have the, the hangover literal effects yeah. of, 
of, get that. Um, of drinking. Um, but what we're now seeing is that you're seeing um, people maybe not taking on a complete sober lifestyle, yeah. but just taking out occasions or drinking less at an occasion as well, I see. which is um, a little bit where we come in is um, while people, a third of our consumers use us as a replacement for alcohol, two thirds use us actually throughout the day. Um, and so when they're using us as a replacement, they're either using us as a session extender. So I'll have a drink, but oh, I still want to like yeah. be a part of the party. So I'll have a different yeah. drink, right? I'll have mm -hmm. a hop lark. Um, but what's cool about this product is that we're actually taking hops from beer occasions into new occasions and categories mm -hmm. with tea and water. Gotcha. And so people are having a craft beer experience throughout the day. Gotcha. Feeling like they're doing something a little naughty, but doing something quite nice for themselves. So <laughs> well, and I, I'm curious on on this side. So, for example, you know, I I wonder how much of your audience is just simply likes the beverage. I know from a positioning standpoint, the sober curious community is really one where you want to anchor yourself, uh, uh, or at least somewhere around that. But I'm thinking of folks like myself who might just like the product itself because uh, it has it's reminiscent of alcohol. But like you said, you can drink it during the day. Are you seeing people who are just adding it to their pantry as part of a beverage? Yeah, we are. And, and definitely like the Sober Curious um, target is an important consumer for us. But we yeah. would actually say that our target unlike other NAs, is actually mm -hmm. the craft beer drinker. Oh, because really? Because we, what we're doing is extending okay. this craft experience for folks to other gotcha. day parts and other categories, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of a cool way to think about NA is to go after a drinker and then provide a better for you option that they can incorporate um, throughout their lifestyle, mm -hmm. essentially. Okay. Wow. Okay. I love that. Thank you. Well, let's talk a little bit I want to jump back a little and talk a little bit about, you know, how you have come to here. We mentioned a little bit about your past. Can you share the story a little bit about what, how you, how you came to General Mills because you didn't start out kind of in a marketing capacity. I think you might come from finance if my memory serves correctly. Uh, how did you find yourself in General Mills? Cause you were there 14 or 15 years. <laughs> yeah. Correct? Um, by happenstance. So I actually, um, I, I did start, I started my career actually in economic development and then moved over to a number of financial startups. I see. Um, so I worked at, uh, like a life insurance platform place. And then I ended up at the Motley Fool, which does oh. investment education. Mm -hmm. And I was helping them create D to C businesses. And everyone there was so passionate about what they did. Um, you know, you had people running customer service who used to make, you know, well over a million dollars as brokers mm -hmm. and, you know, in the finance industry who mm -hmm. would come for $40,000 and talk to people all day about oh. their finances and yeah. manage their own portfolios. And they were just so passionate. And so I went to business school to start a business or work in a small business, um, you know, my my goal coming out of college was like actually just to live someplace I'd never lived and, oh. and to not work in corporate America. It was like my stated objective in life. <laughs> and then you were at General Mills. And then I was at General Mills. So I, I, went to, I went to business school to, um, to really start something. And uh, over that first year, one of the career counselors, who's now a great mentor of mine, um, Everett Fortner, said, this is your chance to do something big and get a big name on your resume. I know you don't want to, I, I know you don't want to be there, but th there is cachet and importance in that in your career over time. So use this opportunity, go to one of the big companies, use it as a training ground, stay for two years and you'll be fine. So, you know, I had offers kind of across the board. What I liked about General Mills is, um, in general, food is a passion area. It's mm -hmm. like where we connect as humans. Um, you know, Cheerios was a lifeline long brand for me. Mm -hmm. uh, Pillsbury. I mean, the brands meant a lot in, mm -hmm. uh, to my personal life. But marketing at General Mills, um, 
like brand management is we call it the hub of the wheel, right? So they are the general mm -hmm. managers of the business. Mm -hmm. And there are organizations where marketing is more on the creative and yeah. calm side and yeah. kind of growth drivers. And then there are also companies where your brand manager is like your true general manager mm -hmm. and other people kind of do the growth driving, if you will. And General Mills is a combo of the two. Yeah. So you are the general manager, but it is yeah. equal parts business management and um, growth driving. Right. And I like that blend because that's, I always saw myself as running a business, but I do it from a marketing first mindset of thinking yeah. about the consumer and the yeah. value proposition that we're adding. And so <laughs> That fit for me. Um, and I went there and I was like, I am out in two years. And then 15 years later, here I am. Um, but <laughs> Well, the, that is two years in corporate time, I think. It, it is. Um, <laughs> I, I did do it very intentionally, though. Um, and it wasn't a set and forget mentality. Is every year we, did, we would rotate um, through different businesses. So you're changing a lot. You're seeing a lot of different things. But every year, I mm -hmm. would go out on the open market. I would apply for jobs. I would see what was available. Mm -hmm. And for many years at Mills, what I, the opportunities that I had internally far outstripped the opportunities externally. Really? But I would make a choice. I would mm -hmm. make a choice to stay and go to the next thing. And mm -hmm. I had the opportunity to run a, um, like an entrepreneur program there, an mm -hmm. incubator of mm -hmm. how to launch new products and disruptive mm -hmm. products. In the marketplace, I got to run the convenience and food service portfolio of product yeah. and innovation. I, um, I got to run YoPlay during the years where Chobani was disrupting the category. And wow. how do you redefine a brand and find a place when you have yes. been completely um, disrupted and pushed out of the position that you held? Um, mm -hmm. So the, the opportunities that I would choose... Um, were quite interesting. I mean, they were growth opportunities for sure. me. Um, but while I was there, I um, I had started a program of entrepreneur mentorship um, when I was in this incubator. And the entrepreneurs loved it because they thought they got access to like all of these smart people. And you're like, mm, I don't know, we're just people in a company. Yeah. <laughs> um, but kind of the training that we had had at Mills. But really what we were doing was bringing those entrepreneurs to train our marketers and our R and D folks of how to be more agile and think mm -hmm. more like entrepreneurs. Yeah. But, but through that, I started this network of entrepreneurs and it's where my heart is. It's mm -hmm. where the mm -hmm. way that I kind of approach business has always been more entrepreneurial um, and started to advise on the side. Um, and that became my hobby of hanging side out with hustle. entrepreneurs. Yep. Side hustle. <laughs> side <Got> hustle. <laughs> uh, so I eventually left to do that. Yeah. Okay. So yes, yeah. after 14, 15 years, you, you, you had been working with these brands and, and it sounds like you found your sweet spot. I did. And you know, it, it's interesting when people leave big corporations, sometimes it feels like this giant, like your personality gets caught up in, in these cultures and the yeah. places, right? Yeah. Um, but for me, I always knew that General Mills and I were going to break up. The question was when. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, like it's not a it's not a big thing. It's just kind of like when do you feel like you stop growing? Yeah. Um, and there was a point for me where it was like, okay, like I know this system and I get it, but I felt like I was shrinking. And so mm -hmm. it was my time to kind of go – see what else was out there and mm -hmm. um, the energy that I get from small companies because they inherently have to look outwards, yeah. right? Like yeah. you don't have any time to kind yeah. of have a meeting internally. You yeah. are out meeting the consumer, trying yes. to drive distribution, like yes. growing in the marketplace. And um, that external or marketplace perspective is what gives me energy. Mm-hmm. I love that. And you mentioned something I, this is something I have asked a few people before, but the first time I, in, or the first time I asked it was of Jane Miller and kind of that shift of working from a multinational and stepping into an entrepreneurial brand and how the, not just the environment of startup was sort of, uh, 
it's it's sort of a whiplash. She she didn't use that term, but it's very it's a severe change because you go from having redundancies and budgets, resources, and uh, a, a, a type of environment to a startup where it's you. Oftentimes, yeah. it, it, you know, up until you're maybe even until you're an eighty million dollar brand, you could be a couple of people before yep. you really start to have the kind of budgets that you need to be doing to grow. So I can not through my own personal experience, but from these other women that I've interviewed, I can appreciate the difference between going from general mills to, to a sort of entrepreneurial brand. And the fact that it was uh, more of an easy slide for you than maybe some others that we have witnessed through some of the work that we have done. Like that's, that's a, that's a thing. I think you either naturally have that skill or you have to build the muscle. And sometimes that muscle requires a lot of training and nothing wrong with it. It's just, you know, be prepared. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I was always what I called it. I mean, even in college when I played softball, I was a player coach Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. and I play up and down pretty well. Yeah. Um, I like to get in the weeds a little bit, mm. which can drive some people crazy. Um, <laughs> so I've learned not to and to enable people to do things. But, you know, I, I like to say you, you have to be able to flip flop from, you know, driving a category strategy mm-hmm. and a five year vision of where mm-hmm. we're going and what the fundraising strategy looks mm-hmm. like to like you order the business cards. Mm hmm. Yep, that's what you're doing. You may have to that's pack what boxes you're doing today. today. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you gotta you gotta be able to flex and yes. be comfortable with it. Absolutely, and things can't. I don't want to use it. Things can't be beneath you. I don't want to. Yeah, it's not that people feel things are beneath them, but sometimes when you if you've not worked in a small environment and you come into a small environment, you really actually don't know what the extent of your responsibilities are going to be until you get there. And in a true entrepreneurial spirit, you might be a CMO or a COO, and you may be answering phones or yeah. <laughs> uploading social media. And uh, that's the fun of it. But you have to be prepared for it. Yeah, you do. Yeah. It's like, there was a period in, in the last few months where uh, our our direct to consumer um, customer service person left, and mm-hmm. I had a shift answering mm-hmm. customer responses for yeah. you know a few hours a week, and yeah. um, and also everyone should do that. That's the other right? takeaway, right? Like you gotta yes. remember to stay close to the consumer. Absolutely. And like, maybe it's not every week, but every month, yeah, everyone should be kind of regardless of the level of the company absolutely to be spending time with our consumers. Absolutely. I, so uh, when I was in high school, I worked in fast food college. I worked in fast food. I had friends that worked in retail and I believe that everybody should at, have at least six months of interfacing directly with the general public in their life at some point, at the very minimum. I like your idea of regularly dropping in, but getting that FaceTime, not the sanitized, cleaned up response deck, but having to respond to somebody who, where things didn't go sideways. Like getting yeah. positive responses is great, but the learning is in the something happened. And then the strength of the brand is how you handle the something totally. happened. That's yep. the strength of the brand is being able to overcome it and taking it. I'm not taking it on the chin, but just, just going, yeah. okay, this is how, we're, this is how we're going to fix it for you. This yeah. is, this is a real thing. Like, yeah. and how do we show up for you? Yeah. 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 So let's talk a little bit more about this connecting, networking, mentoring. I know you're with SKU. You also have a couple and if for briefly tell us what SKU is here, but quickly, you have a passion here in growing people. And I'm curious, as we see more and more women entering food and beverage, which I feel like there's so much more now than ever, for some from non traditional backgrounds, or even no backgrounds at all, I can't tell you how many phone calls I get from somebody who has been making something in their kitchen for the last 15 years. And now it's time to make it real. Like, what are you encouraged by when you're out here doing this work? Yeah, I mean, 
I'm encouraged by the talent that exists. Um, mm -hmm. I. I do believe very strongly um, that women need networks. Um, so SKU is uh, SKU is a new products incubator mm -hmm. um, for uh, mostly products in the natural space. But mm -hmm. um, companies uh, apply; they get they get accepted or or not. But then mm -hmm. they get a team of mentors that works with them uh, through, I think it's a 12 week course mm -hmm. to hone their pitch. And gotcha. usually they come in with an issue that we're working on. Mm -hmm. I worked with an incredible company called No Bull, um, mm -hmm. which is a real veggie burger uh, from mm -hmm. two amazing women out of Charlottesville. Um, mm -hmm. And it was just that. Chris Ann had taken a family recipe that's a lentil based burger um, people loved it. Uh, she built a business on catering around it mm -hmm. and um, commercialized it and had been selling it regionally. And her sister, or her daughter, Lizzie, joined her. And now they have this company um, and they got Whole Foods National Distribution while we were working mm -hmm. with them. And, and the question is like, how, what do they do next? How do you grow mm -hmm. this thing? We know mm -hmm. how to do this. How do you expand? Um, and so that's that's business networking, right? And getting the right resources mm -hmm. to the right founders. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, OSC Jedi is about increasing both the yes. presence of women and diversity yes. in leadership and as entrepreneurs within, within the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And it is our job as professionals to provide that um, base of un knowledge and understanding mm -hmm. and what we have learned to give more opportunities uh, yeah. to drive success across, yeah. um, you know, the entire base. And yeah. increase, like we are, the industry is better when we are uh, better represented. Agreed. We have more diversity. I mean, it's been proven many times that companies that have women leaders are more profitable, more mm -hmm. successful in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but we also bring a humanity. And as women leaders, there is still very much the leadership gap. Like the, you know, about 50%, a little over 50% of um, of the workforce of people coming in are women. So yeah. it's about 56%. And yet we still do not see, like the funnel is real. And yeah. we don't see the representation at the top. Yeah, um, And it's not getting better. Like that gender divide is not closing. Yeah. Um, in fact, over COVID, it has uh, started to widen again yeah. as yeah. women are taking on not only, you know, their jobs, but they're once again taking on more at home. Yeah. Um, they're taking the leadership roles yeah. to drive diversity, which is like a plus one job at, yeah. at their jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and so the level of strain to stay in the game or to put enough focus on yourself mm -hmm. to be able to move up a ladder um, is is hard. And so the broad-based net, like it's proven that both men and women need a broad-based network to succeed. Right, right. But women who have a close circle of um, intimate relationships within their working environment are 2.5 uh, times uh, have higher pay, authority, mm -hmm. and roles. And so as women, we need this group um, of people that you can lean on, whether it's a mentor circle mm -hmm. or your own personal mm -hmm. board of directors mm -hmm. to work through what's going on in your work and life environment. And what we find is that, or I find personally, but like having those connections gives me the confidence to get over um, um, you know, to, to get over th the hurdles that are yeah. in front of you every day and yeah. say like, nope, that guy could go through it. Like I can too. Right. Um, or, oh, that's a different way to look at this and bring in a perspective that mm -hmm. gives me more confidence to kind of move through life. Yeah, I, I get that. I, I'm curious your thoughts here. One of the things that I learned from Kira, D Kira Dilly, who's over at Frida Lay, is she said the number of women startups, I think, is outpacing the number of men, mostly, and the number of single mothers 
is a pretty sig- is pretty significant of the women in the, on the startup sector in food and beverage of course I mm-hmm. I can't I don't know that we can speak and I'm curious your thoughts on the fact that women are sort of in some respects driving innovation by default because you know, they're creating jobs in order to find a work environment that works for them and so they create their own work environment yeah. but subsequently they're coming up with the new ideas it's just an idea that popped in my head but i'm curious your thoughts on that yeah i mean i i think it's amazing and mm-hmm. remarkable but uh what we're seeing exactly what you you're you're saying and mm-hmm. i think we're also starting to see it through um bipoc fa- founders as well is uh-huh. that the that the products and the services um, and the work environments that I want to be in Mm -hmm. that support me as Mm -hmm. a person don't exist. So I'm just going to go create it. Make it myself. Make it myself. Um, And like that is remarkable. And that's, that's, of course, women have that energy. Of course they do. (laughs) Well, we'll figure out a way to to make it and absolutely manifest it into being. Absolutely. And I also think that in some ways, like up here in the multinationals, if the if we've got BIPOC um, people with disabilities, women underrepresented because they don't feel heard or the opportunities aren't available or what ha- what have you, and that knowledge, estate, and passion goes to entre- more entrepreneurial brands. In some ways, in some ways, I want to say that there's progress in this, correct? And, and hear me out. You, I, you may completely disagree with me, but I'm thinking to myself, no other time in history do does this group of people have access to the ability to create a business. When I was a kid in the 80s, I didn't know anybody that was starting a business. And my kids know plenty of people that have started businesses. So I feel it's a weird kind of progress, but a progress nonetheless. Does that make sense? Am I crazy in my thinking there? No, I mean, um, like exposure to to new things like opens up the world. Um, Yeah, and like I think of it as my own daughter, who's Mm -hmm. who's five. Mm -hmm. Um, And you know, when I was five, my mom was a teacher, and my dad Mm -hmm. like worked at a bank, and like. I didn't really know that there were other jobs. Like, I didn't know even that, like, something like General Mills existed. Right. Even though, like, Warner Lambert was in my backyard. Oh, Um, interesting. So we had, I grew up in New Jersey, there were large multinational food companies, but I didn't know brand management was was a thing. Like, people were a teacher. Yeah. Um, You know, my daughter, like, is already creating her own businesses. Right. Like that's like how she plays. <laughs> She's like, today we're going to have a blueberry farm. And yes. you're like, okay. Um, Why not? But like her exposure to people creating things is very different. Yes. And I love that. Yes. Wow. Well, Betsy, I want to come back to, well, I don't know if it's coming back to you, but <laughs> As as we are starting to wrap up the podcast, there's a few things that I like to ask. And one is, what kind of advice do you find yourself giving others on a similar journey as yourself? And that is, you started someplace that was really a catapult for someplace else. Yeah, I think there's two things that um, I often tell people. One is, um, you don't have to stay someplace if you're not happy. Like there are a lot of options Mm -hmm. and not every place is the right fit. Mm -hmm. Um, And that is okay. And Mm -hmm. you should, um, you you need to have the ability to say like, it's okay. Like you guys have your values. I have mine. Yeah. Like this is not a right cultural fit and go find the right place for you. The amount of energy that people put into staying in the wrong environments. Yeah is ridiculous. So that's one, like, Mm -hmm. it's okay. Like, let's Mm -hmm. go find the right place for you. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the second is keep your eye open for new doors. Um, 
And like, there's, there is strength in having a plan for yeah. sure. And yeah. like, you know, thinking like, oh, I think that's what success looks like for me. Right. Because then you, you you have some, if you set a point, you know how to get there. Yeah. But if you are only stuck on that point, you miss these amazing doors that open themselves mm -hmm. and that can take you on a journey that you didn't expect. Mm -hmm. Um, and so be open, like say yes to things, just say yeah. yes and see mm -hmm. where it takes you. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, you got to start. Um, and so, uh, I had a great mentor who, um, Eric Rideholm, who ended up being a Emmy award winning, uh, producer of Pardon the Interruption, but he was, uh, one of the three founders at The Motley Fool. And when he was leaving The Fool, he was like, when I retire one day, I want, I want to occasionally write an article for the Chicago trip, a sports article. He's like, I guess I have to write an article at all. <laughs> so he writes an article, he submits it. Of course, like Eric, like it gets picked up and published and his old, he worked at ESPN in his first job. His whole boss sees it, calls him. Mm -hmm. Next mm -hmm. thing you know, he's like an Emmy award winning producer on part of the eruption. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's how life works. But you always have to write the article, like right. just do the one step mm -hmm. and then see what doors open mm -hmm. and then be, be willing to explore those doors as you go. Um, and you'll actually find where you need to end up and it might be different than what you thought. Yeah. I'd love that POV. That's pretty fantastic. Well, so what's next for you or Hoplark? What, what can you share with us and what's the next six months look like? Yeah, well, we're we're super excited. You know, I, I just started this role as CEO in January. Oh, um, and so official, uh, official, um, and we are looking at um, making the brand more holistic, telling more stories about mm -hmm. the brand itself. People mm -hmm. love the product, but we really haven't yeah. built the Hoplark brand or mm -hmm. or tapped into the power of the community that we have. Mm -hmm. um, we're gaining some distribution. So look mm -hmm. for it in your stores in both the tea set, the water set and the non-alcoholic beer set. But we're just really focused right now on, on building that Hoplark community, um, living our best life as these hophead nerds that we are. <laughs> um, we've been creating some really fun content. Um, not so drunk history, for example. That's fun. Um, yeah. Super so fun. we've got a lot of fun things kind of coming up here. Oh, my goodness. That sounds great. And I'll be looking forward to that. Okay, I have one last question before we wrap it up. And, and it's this. Uh, are there any other women leaders that you would like to um, elevate for the work that they're doing right now? Well, I, uh, I'd, I'd like to just shout out to kind of um, one of my, my circles. Okay. That um, I have a group of women um, who are all from General Mills and wonderful ex General Millsers, uh, who all have created their own careers. Mm -hmm. Um, Gail Peterson, who's the CMO of Ecolab, um, Elizabeth Diley, who actually still runs recruiting at General Mills, um, Subasa Tanaka, who, uh, is chief commercial officer over at AMSAM doing some awesome oh, work. Yeah. Um, Joanna Hargis, who is now a fractional CEO at Noble. Um, with Chris Ann and Lizzie and the amazing work that they're doing. Mm -hmm. And Angie Rossi, who's uh, my co-leader in um, OSC Jedi, who runs innovation at John B. Filipino and Sam Filipino and Sons. Um, and this group of women uh, is my constant network. Um, mm. Someone where whatever problem you have, at least once a day, I get a text from one of them. And to be able to support and lift up each other's journeys uh, mm -hmm. as we go and run companies and mm -hmm. um, influence and uh, build a network out of that. We have a whole network of other companies that we work with and amazing founders. And it's just been uh, a remarkable uh, network to be a part of. Oh, that sounds amazing. I'm super jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, thank you so much for that. Now, uh, we have been talking with Betsy Frost, CEO of Hoplark. Betsy, where can people learn more about you and your company? 
Uh, you can uh, find us at hoplark.com uh, okay. or follow us at Drink Hoplark on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. And you can find me um, at LinkedIn at Betsy Frost. Love it. Thank you for your time today, Betsy. I am so happy to have uh, spent this time with you and I look forward to seeing what's next through the work you're doing. Thank you. And yeah. And thank you listeners for your time today. If you like this episode, please share it with a friend. Otherwise have a great rest of your day and we'll catch you next time on the Gooder podcast. Produced by HeartCast Media.